1953, I was four. And the symptoms were masked initially because I had measles at the same time. My main recollection of it is feeling very, very weak, very feverish, very sweaty, shaky. Uh, when polio was diagnosed, I was taken to a isolation hospital, but I remember nothing about that move, and I remember nothing for about a week and a half. When I do remember from there on, I remember there was no pain, just a lot of weakness. Uh, I then moved from isolation hospital to the Princess Grace, where I was for a number of months undergoing a large amount of physiotherapy on my right leg because it was wasted at the uh, thigh and almost 100% paralysis below the knee. Uh, I can move two toes of my right foot. My right foot is size 7 and my left foot is size 9. This was the, the only effect that it had on me. Uh, while I was at the hospital, they taught me how to use the calipers, double iron calipers first and then onto single and crutches. The recent paralysis epidemic in South Australia brought most of the affected children to the wards of the Adelaide Children's Hospital. Unfortunately, some of these little patients will have to receive hospital treatment for many months. Some of the, the polio epidemic devastated this community in the 50s and early 60s. Every schoolroom had a child with permanently crippled legs. I think that was the first time we'd ever really heard about immunization. They brought out this thing called the salt vaccine. I'm gonna fall off 30 degrees. Charles Stein was 22 and a young law student when he was first infected with and disabled by the polio virus. I was in an iron lung. I had a major paralysis nearly everywhere. I would lay awake and think about what was going to happen to me and would I be a burden to my family and to society and thought I'd be better off dead. Today, nearly four decades later, he is experiencing new muscle fatigue as polio-like symptoms mysteriously weaken his body, forcing him to relive the disease. Okay. One day, walking around, I began to get weak. That was very traumatic. It was a vivid demonstration of, that I, of how I was going to get weaker, probably, and, and uh, have more problems down the road. Elaine Burns is a former polio poster child whose entire life has been traumatized by the lasting effects of her first experience with paralytic polio 41 years ago. It was a, a few days before my third birthday. I do remember collapsing, being unable to walk. I was initially paralyzed from the neck down and eventually was able to walk with the aid of brace and crutches. Elaine has never shed her leg braces, crutches, or the emotional pain. But she had come to terms with the disease until now. I did accept it. There was, there was nothing I could do. It happened. I accepted it and just went on with my life. But now with the recurrence? Th that's a little harder to accept. It does seem a little unfair that it's happening again. It's happening again to many of the one and a half million survivors of the original polio epidemic of the 1940s and 50s. Experts feel that by the end of this decade, as many as 500,000 of them will suffer some effects of this recurrence. And the symptoms mimic those of the original polio. New muscle weakness, painful joints, breathing problems, and fatigue. You're doing that very well. It is called post-polio syndrome. The cause is unknown, though there are many theories, including the idea that the fewer nerve cells remaining after the original polio simply wear out. How do you feel? They feel like they're twice cursed. Are you getting tired? And they say, you know, my God, I've done this fight. I fought this battle and I won. And why am I having to start all over again? Why do I have to fight the same battle a second time? You got all this extra stress and strain on those joints, yes. which produces pain. Yes. Discomfort. Dr. Laurel Halstead is the director of the post-polio program at the National Rehabilitation Hospital in Washington, D.C. Oh, so I was okay. in an iron lung for a little while. Oh. He is also waging his own 12-year battle with post-polio syndrome. He travels the hospital corridors on a cart to conserve his limited energy. And he takes daily rest periods with oxygen supplements. He also has had to return to the use of a leg brace, just as he did 40 years ago. That, that was quite emotional. I mean, no one likes to get older, no one likes to get sick, but perhaps more than anything, no one likes to be disabled. I resurrected this out of my mother's things. I don't know why she saved this. This is a brace that I wore as a child. It for most polio survivors, the braces are a powerful, painful reminder of what they thought they had escaped. 
To help them, there are now over 350 independent support groups nationally for post-polio syndrome patients. For many, these groups are the first chance the polio survivors have had to share fears and common feelings they may have repressed for decades. I think for me what was frightening was um, a doctor telling me that I had to wear a brace again. Was it a brace for the rest of you? The eye? Yes, yes. Brace. This is the brace. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And you remember what, where you started and what you shed away. And you say, well, no, no, this is the brace. When is the wheelchair coming? A recently completed study at the laboratories of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders concluded that post-polio syndrome is a progressive disease that saps patients of the remaining strength at the rate of about 1% per year. This summer, Dr. Marinos Delakis will begin to study the effectiveness of nerve growth factor as a potential treatment for post-polio syndrome. But until medical science can provide answers, there is genuine fear. Yes, I do fear the future. Loss of independence, you know, that's my greatest fear, loss of independence. And for those with post-polio syndrome, that fear is no longer in the future. This is Dr. Timothy Johnson for The American Agenda.